what I do in my work is to illustrate in lots of different fields, in lots of different circumstances, how complex systems function. Uh, the reason this is important is because we live in a world in which, as Alan referred to earlier, there is a habit of reductionism. Um, we would very much like to think in ways that have direct causations and direct solutions in which we could create very linear strategies toward achieving those solutions. And somewhere deep inside all of us is the, the some hundred years or so, at least, of the development of industrial models, mechanical models, that have influenced the way that we think about how to problem solve. But the thing is this, if there's something wrong with my Volvo, I can fix it. I can replace the part. I can figure out where that problem is, and I can adjust it. But when there's something wrong with my kids, I can't do that. Why not? So that's, that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about, just to kind of lay open our perspective, our epistemological frame for how we're going to be looking at this and what, what new information we might be able to generate together. Let's start with the child. And let's zoom in on the child, all the way in, micro, micro, micro. In our culture, we are really good at zooming in. All of our instruments are about zooming in. The, the, the creation of data is largely about zooming in. To do that, we have to decontextualize. And that's OK for the moment. Now, what we don't generally do is to put whatever it is we're studying, be it a child or an ecology or anything else, back into the context we pulled it out of to see how it works in its relationships. So for the time being, let's start by saying, what is the ecology of the child? What are the, the interdependencies and the interrelationships in which the child's vitality is nested? OK, so let's go in. And on, on the, the inside of the child, there are questions of well-being that have to do with history, genetics, food, sleep. How is that child feeling? How is that child's metabolism functioning? How are the, the microorganisms in that child's tummy working out? How is the, the skin and the ability to perceive and make words, the language skills, how is that developing? So when we zoom in, we can see that there's this whole world of interdependent systems. Their metabolism, their nervous system, their cognitive systems, their digestive systems, all those systems in interaction give that child life. But that child does not exist alone. In order to have all of those systems be interdependent and be in vitality, they are also interdependent in larger contexts, in relationship, in relationship to the natural world, OK? Air, food, other people, nature, dirt, life, vegetables. The child's family. What are the relationships in the family? How is communication working in this family? What are you allowed to talk about? What are you not allowed to talk about? 
How do problems get solved in this family? How do we begin to see how to make sense of life through the lens of a particular family, set of communication, relationships? Does your father have a temper? Does your mother work too much? Is there a competition with siblings? Is there someone sick in the family? All of these patterns of relationship become part of the patterns of that child's life. And then it goes out again. And there's school. And there's the relationship to how that child's family communication might be different to the communication in the classroom. What kind of contrasts are, is the child orchestrating cognitively and language-wise, communicatively, emotionally, physically? between their family and school and the internal workings of their body. And then school, of course, is part of a culture. It's part of a set of ideological and epistemological expectations that are larger than the classroom, larger than the family, that have historical iterations and ramifications and go into the future in ways. What, what do we expect of our children? Somehow the future is always attached to education. What are you going to be when you grow up? What will happen to you if you don't do well in school? So there's this issue of time. But children are also part of the economy. And they're part of living inside a world that says that it matters how they consume, whether they're in the poverty groups or the non-poverty groups, and who are they? in relationship to their culture in that frame. So when we start to look at care of a child and ask the question about what is well-being, that question extends across many systems. Um, internal systems, biological systems, cultural systems, but also social systems, education, economy, um, medicine, the legal system, right? Whose custody is the child under? What is the legality of giving the child medication or not giving the child medication? What is the legality of having the child in school or not having the child in school? Politics. Children are carrying a lot of politics. What are the politics of where these policies come from? It's already come up in this room. So what I wanted to do a little bit is to just illustrate that zoom in and that zoom out of how our interaction, our being as parents, as social workers, teachers, doctors, um, politicians, exercise teachers, whatever it is, we are in interaction with this very complex set of systems. Now, all these esteemed people on this panel today and the next set have particular sets of expertise and that's very valuable. Um, but I would argue that globally in this moment, the complexity of the problems that we face are no longer approachable by one expert at a time or even teams of experts. We need to begin the process of having conversations, generating learning across professions, across fields of expertise, so that we can have a better access to the complexity. It just isn't going to work to pull out a piece of the child and address a solution to a part of that problem without having any understanding of how it reverberates into the other systems around the child. Um, what we were talking earlier about what happens to these drugs. Now, 
In the United States, 15 years ago, the doctors that were prescribing the stimulants had no idea that the competition in the university system and the way that this was going to emerge and evolve into a situation with those kids so many years later. They had no idea. So my, my take on this is that everyone is doing the best they can. The kids are doing the best they can. The teachers are doing the best they can. The parents are doing the best they can. The doctors are doing the best they can. The pharmaceutical <coughs> companies are doing the best they can <laughs> to make some money. <laughs> um, and that in order to take our research, our understanding, and our ability to create better treatment further, what, what we have to do is to break down the barriers between those systems and open the conversation. Now, the difficulty of that is that there are no experts in that department. That means that while the expertise that we have is very valuable, it's not enough. And that in order to get further, we have to be able to suspend our own sense of rightness and authority and credibility and be willing to not know. To be, be willing to say the information that's been gathered thus far is beautiful and valuable, but we need more. We don't know how or where to develop this set of treatments for this very complex issue because it's spanning all over the place. It's social, it's medical, it's cultural. And where are the in points to all those different places in the system? Well, I seriously doubt they're in a pill. I'll tell you that. But the pill is part of it. And we can't rule that out. So what I would like to do most of all is open this up to the the important interdependencies between not only the biological systems inside the child, but the interdependencies of that child in the social systems as well, across institutions and um, deep in our culture. OK, that is the sort of the entrance to that. And I would like to begin with this panel, um, which is to really get into and to um, explore the nature of this situation. This afternoon, we're going to be having another panel whose job it is to try to think about what to do. Okay, That doesn't mean that if you have some brilliant idea, you can't say. Um, because we are speaking across multiple disciplines, across multiple professions, um, I would ask all of you on the panel, and you as well, to remain curious. Um, there, hopefully, is a lot to be learned. Hopefully, you'll hear about things you haven't heard before, because there's a combination of fields of knowledge that, um, that we don't often get to see combined. So, um, I guess I would like to start since I said that we were talking about the ecology of the child. Um, and I used that term because loosely, an ecology can be defined as an organism existing in a pattern of relationships of interdependency. Um, and that interdependency extends into another kind of ecology probably the one we're more used to discussing, the ecology of nature, as though somehow we were separate from that. Thomas Jungberi, how's that? Yes. Uh, Thomas is a MD and associate professor in pharmacology. He's a researcher in a number of scientific fields, such as psychopharmacology, neuropsychology, ethology, psychotherapy. He's written four books and many scientific articles on these subjects. 
Welcome, Thomas. Johan is a psychologist, a PhD a psychotherapist and supervisor. He's worked as psychologist and family therapist at child and adolescent psychiatry clinics. Currently, he works as an external advisor, consultant, educator, and supervisor within child and youth psychiatry. Lotta Besko, child and adolescent psychiatrist as well, working at child and adolescent psychiatry clinics since 99, family therapist, has made a study together with Ketty, who's also here, uh, Hagman, regarding parents' view on ADHD and its treatment. Uh, Anne-Marie is public health scientist and zoo physiologist. Has worked, has worked many years with research, public education, and politics regarding the importance of diet and nutrition in relation to crime, ADHD, and autism. Published a number of papers, and last year also a book on the subject. There's the book. Elizabeth Norin. Um, a PhD and associate professor, background in pharmacy, chemistry, and microbiology. As associate professor, her research focuses on the complex interactions between gut flora and the host organism in health and disease. And actually, my group at Karolinska is microbial ecology. And Cecilia, last but not least, is a preschool teacher. Um, with special interest and in in-depth knowledge regarding nutrition's effect on children's well-being and learning in school. I would like to start with this relationship between systems that I had sort of brought up in the introduction and start with you, Elizabeth, because um, I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about this mysterious field of microbiology and um, how that is how you're finding that it affects uh, behavior and um, cognition, things like that. A long time to give me. Not very <laughs> long, because we're actually having a conversation. Yeah. But just to open it up, and then as we begin, feel free to dive in if you have thoughts. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about this mysterious field of microbiology and um, how that is how you're finding that it affects uh, behavior and um, cognition, things like that. Uh, so the child is normally born germ-free without any microbes. And then we get the microbes into the child in different ways. The most normal way is by giving the birth uh, vaginally. Then the child has the best possibilities to catch up intestinal flora in balance. Being by cesarean section or if you treat the children early in life with different antibiotics, you give the child a, a not so good future for how the flora established in the intestine. And we know now that the flora is all the time communicating with the host organism. We can, for instance, say that E. coli, that most of you have heard about, very common microbe, reacts by producing uh, proteins that tell you that I, I have eaten as much as I want. When the flora has got uh, enough food down in the lower intestine, the protein is produced and turned up into the brain, and you react with, OK, I have had enough. So all the time, we produce different <coughs> substances that can influence upon our well-being. And then if you disturb it in one way or another, you have to solve the different problems. And one of the biggest problems we still have is use of antibiotics. Then you have, if, uh, you have all the uh, food additives, the preservatives, the colors, the, the soft makers, all these, that we didn't have 
uh, earlier and how much these substances influences on the composition of the flora we know very little about and we don't take enough care about it but obviously it disturbs. I bought vegetables two weeks ago in an ordinary uh, package as you find all over in the shops and after this dinner I went to the summer house and forgot this one at home but two weeks after it looks exactly the same and if I go out in the garden and pick these leaves they would have been rotten after two weeks so what do we have in our food and how much does it influence upon the ecology. Then I think that the, the brain is very much biochemical and electricity activities. And for to make this correct, you need a lot of, lot of nutrition. And if you don't eat, you die. So, yeah. And um, I think also that if you, you try to um, um, do this di diagnose step by step, you also need to look at the food. How are people eating? And when I worked in uh, the municipality of Nynäshamn, we asked children if they ate uh, breakfast. 60% didn't eat breakfast and they were 12, 12 years old. And when we asked the mother and fathers, they said, told us that 95% ate breakfast before they go to school but they didn't. And then they are walking to the shop and buying some candies instead of eating school lunch. So they can't, I mean, they can't be good pupils in school. They get aggressive and uh, that sort of things. Uh, and, but, but I think that some kids, of course, can figure out without making any aggressions and so on. But you, you can also, if you are doing those diagnosis step by step, you can also measure a lot of things which have with the diet to do. So you can measure the blood sugar if it's going up and down very fast, and then you are, uh, are you can get aggressive very easy. Uh, you can measure allergies. Some allergies uh, make you um, aggressive or uh, unconscious, or you can um, uh, your your brain doesn't work. You can uh, measure peptides in the urine, and those can are opioids, and they can go up to the brain. You can uh, measure gastrointestinal problems, candida, for example, which is overgrowth in many ADHD children and you can um, also measure primary reflexes which is left but uh, there are so many things that you can figure out before you are making the diagnose and as Marie said whether that resonates at all with your practice but also beyond that um, what are what are the sort of extended processes and systems that you're interacting with to deal with ADHD the first, what, what corresponds, I would say, um, I have been uh, asking for several years in our clinic to have a dietist uh, specialist in diet uh, to work with because I've, I find it interesting and important also. And we have, uh, okay, not replicated studies, but there is this uh, very strong study from Holland with, with the elimination diet that had drastic effects. And I think, uh, anyway, if we can help children with diets uh, and things like that, I would say some vulnerable children, they are more sensitive maybe to different types of food. And if we can help them with that, that would be, I would say, harmless. Uh, that would be to prefer before giving pills that we know have side effects and risks. Uh, but of course it's uh, much... Uh, work it's difficult and maybe the kids don't want to eat that diet and uh, it takes time and it costs money and you need support so it's uh, mm. but um, it's not as easy 
No, it's not as easy. And that's, that's the, maybe the biggest danger of the pill, that it's a very easy solution mm -hmm. for the adults around the kid to make it more cooperative and <coughs> calmer. That's very... Mm. When we think about the amount of money and um, transformation that it would take to reorganize the institutions around the children, their educational institution, um, what's for sale in the store, um, the way the agriculture is grown, uh, the approach to um, really giving parents communication skills, uh, and so on and so forth. The, the actual, um, the actual culture building around creating that kind of change, I think, is mind-boggling. Um, whereas a medication is a lot easier to deal with. Again, n never to miss the 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 that three percent or so that Alan was talking about that really do need that really are classic ADHD um, patients. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, w I would just like to um, go on to the, the second part of your question. Did you ask about the wider systems that we uh, work with or interact with? And I just, as you said, parents, of course, the families is the, the closest system. And, uh, and then school is the... Uh, the very important uh, system when we talk about ADHD. And I think um, maybe also here today, uh, we should have more participation of uh, pedago pedagogues, teachers, school, or we need to have more collaboration. Uh, because how we can meet these kids in school, and it's a huge um, challenge for, for the educational system with all these active kids, and, and I don't think we uh, really always have the resources or meet them in the right way, and um, that's, uh, to, to, there are good approaches. We have a good collaboration with the schools in the area where I work, and we also see that we don't have the same increase of uh, uh, assessments for ADHD or diagnosis as in the rest of southern Sweden. So I think it's a very important field to, to work closely with schools and teachers and um, develop ways. And, and like Alan said before, physical activity, I think it's crucial also. We have a, it's a health problem in the population that we move too little. And then we medicate those kids who cannot sit still. So it's really... Uh, <laughs> Dilemma. Well, as a clinical psychologist, uh, this is not my my area of knowledge. Actually, I just listen to it in my special way uh, that uh, we are talking about uh, a multifactorial uh, perspective on things, and and uh, and that is uh, familiar very much to me as a family therapist to have a systemic point of view on things. Um, but I think uh, we here in this room are very much on the same side. We talk, we think systemically, we, we think multifactorially, and uh, uh, we, are all agree, we all agree very much, I think, most of us uh, on a broad perspective on this dilemma that we are talking about. What's, what uh, struck me uh, in the morning, and uh, which is associated to my associations right now, is uh, a dis discussion uh, from the uh, audience to Alan um, about uh, the myth that ADHD uh, should be something very, very different, a disease, a, a brain disease, that is uh, not, uh, we cannot see uh, that this problem and talk about this problem with uh, the general knowledge that we have from a lot of other areas of knowledge. And I think, first of all, we need to decide, uh, uh, we can sit here and all be saved in our uh, uh, fine ideas and perspective about things, but as long as that side is not talking to us and we are not talking to them, 
we have still the di dilemma uh, how to reach some yeah. point uh, ahead uh, and um, and and i so i'm so uh, i'm so um, uh, busy thinking about how uh, should we come to some kind of communication with that side so we can develop our thinking together um, you know we can develop our nice ideas about the kid in the uh, context the kid in that ecology family perspectives social perspectives on the kids situations all of that which is very nice ideas uh, but as long as uh, we have uh, non-communication with that side that says that this, all these ideas about uh, attachment theory, about s child development, about family psychology, this is not a relevant issue in this situation. We are stuck. And that is what I, uh, wh where I am right now. It strikes me that, that part of what is the issue here is the question, because in, in some ways, this problem exists everywhere and nowhere. Um, it, it is all over this context. It's all over the culture. It's all over the, the institutions that we mentioned of medicine and education and politics and economy and uh, psychiatry and so on. But we can't f fix it in any one of those institutions. So somehow what we're really talking about is this, what I think you're getting at is the question of how do, how do we get at the in-between? So the place in the, where's the place in the culture where we can actually implement and affect change in the way that we're able to perceive and discuss the problem so that there is a place to go to, to ask about it in another way, to, to demand research in other ways. Who do, we, who do we ask for another kind of research? I don't know. It's really challenging in a few minutes to say something clever. <laughs> but so I want a little bit change the topic. I think one thing that from the discussion this morning, which you one mentioned, I think is very important, is that in Sweden we have a term called to be politically correct, PC. And somehow in Sweden it has been decided that ADHD is a neuropsychiatric disorder. It's a disease, it's a brain damage, biologically determined dysfunction in the brain, which is genetically caused. And that you cannot question. If you question that, you are attacked immediately by someone. They are not discussing scientific matters, because that you're not allowed to do. If you look at the literature of genes and psychiatric disorders, as Alan was discussing this morning, the uh, research has come very far according to, uh, in relation to schizophrenia, with more than 100 genes identified. But still, there's only a small part of the variation explained by those 100 genes. There's no such data yet on ADHD. But still, this politically correct statement is that 85% of ADHD is genetic which you cannot question. And the, the guidelines from the official Sweden are all in that line, now telling that persons with HD should have medication. That, that's in the new guidelines. And mass media has a very important part of this. For some years ago, there was one of those studies on, on the genes of ADHD published. And the neuropsychiatric people that believe in that said in the mass media that this shows that we have always been correct. But if you read the article, it did not show it. It showed a stress uh, vulnerability support as a biopsychosocial. Several of us tried to re replicate that to mass media, but it was not accepted. So in public, the mass media report that it's a genetic disease, which is not supported by literature, but no one can address that. When I 
sometimes are out lecturing about this, because I'm, I'm, I have written books and articles about it, and very often out lecturing. Then very often uh, someone, I will not mention the names, but they are trying to stop it. They are accusing me of lies, I'm a liar, I'm not a physician, I'm not a scientist. And for example, I've been in Ystad sometimes and lecturing in your place and they were addressing the head of the county council telling me that I was a lunatic, I should not be allowed to come there. I have several letters collected that they are going to the highest authority in Sweden, requiring them to stop me telling things that are not correct, that is that ADHD is not a genetic disorder, disease. So I think this must be also addressed in your ecology. The situation we have in Sweden is that we are not allowed to have any of these ideas around than this accepted truth. There are no arenas to discuss it, as you once mentioned. If you try to discuss it, you are more or less uh, killed publicly. I have written things in big journals in Sweden that I'm a completely mad person, I don't know what I'm talking about and things like that. So I think we have to address that as well. Then there, then there are many details, like Alan was a little bit addressing that ADHD is, is a construct. And ADHD with DSM-3 is a different thing with ADHD in DSM-4, which is different from DSM-5. For example, one important change, which has not been mentioned here, is that in DSM-4, psychological trauma or a complicated background was a differential diagnosis. If you had trauma in your background or you had psychosocial adversities in your background and you had problems because of that, you could not have ADHD. But in DSM-5 you can, it's considered a risk factor, which means that all kinds of accumulated psychosocial adversities can now be called ADHD. And the last thing with the drug treatment, Many people in this officially recognized truth, uh, central stimulant is a cure for ADHD. But as Alan also said, it's, it's a general enhancer. Central stimulants can be used by athletes, college students, fighter pilots to enhance the performance. So just because you increase your performance in some way doesn't mean you have ADHD. So I think it, that needs to be also included in the discussion that there are unspecific medications that we use. And it's also interesting, Sweden has very high requirements of introducing new drugs. But it's very interesting that up to 10-12% of, of boys can, be, can have this medication without having any long-term data. You only have six months data, but you have long-term treatment which you don't have any data to support, and 10% are medicated with it. So there are so many strange things in this area which cannot be discussed openly in Sweden because of some monopoly of this neuropsychiatric view on ADHD. And do you think that the limits around discussion of this topic, I mean, Obviously, when we're talking about the care of children and the possibility of our children doing well in school and the well-being of them feeling like they can fit in and be part of their classroom and their family, that they can succeed. I mean, clearly, the stakes are high. Who doesn't want their children to succeed? Right? Mm. Um, and I, I understand that. And I also understand that the evidence around the immediate effects, if you will, of the use of the drug in the diagnostic process are positive. The kid is, is, is exhibiting inattention and hyperactivity and you give them the drug and it, they, it, there is an effect. It's, the rest of the story that's missing, um, which is why I'm bringing up this notion of ecology, is that if you just look there, it works. But that's not even one small percentage of what's actually happening, and what's happening across time, not only across 
systems in the society, but across time. Um, who knows what will become of those kids that are taking those drugs now in 10 years? Will they be the ones that are selling them in their gymnasium and university classes? That's what happened in the States. Um, the kids that got prescribed the drugs became the dealers. And, and it was difficult to tell them not to do it because uh, no one knows and this culture emerged and we, nobody knew what was happening. I think the numbers are still murky around that and the, the larger ripples into the culture are still largely unknown. So this kind of um, binary around the, the idea of the, what, whether the medication should be talked about in this way or not, I don't feel is, is useful, and I think you, you might agree with me, that if we are looking for ways to d further develop the science and the research, what we have to do is be able to look ahead and think about what might be included in our studies that isn't now, um, and to take it in that direction. And how about from the voice of the classroom? What are you seeing? As I see it, for, as a preschool teacher, I think it's important that we start to listen to the kid itself, because I think the kid, just by showing with the body language, they show us what they need. And if I just have the time, and I often don't, I, but if I have the time, I can try to make an environment that will help these kids to do well in school. I can give them tasks, so they can do the same task as other kids, but in a different way, so they can feel that I did it, I made it, and that will increase their self-esteem, and I think that will make them feel better, and it's a win-win situation, I think. Have you any um, information about what some of the effects are of these stimulant um, drugs? I guess here you use something called Concerta, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's different from what we call Adderall in that it's a, a little bit softer. Is that correct? But it depends on the dosage, clearly, because... What is Adderall? It's basically Ritalin. It's basically Ritalin. It's the same. Yeah. Do you have any idea how those chemicals affect the microbacteria? I don't have any specific answer to you, but I know that the uh, intestinal bacteria are very active. We have more cells in the intestine as in the whole body, and of course they are active and degrade in different ways depending on how many there are, and if they are there at all. All the bikes need different diets and, and metabolize it in different ways. And what do you, is your experience, Thomas, in terms of, because you, I know you have a history in pharmacology, in terms of the emergence of addiction um, ar around these drugs? Well, I th think there are, Two questions. The first question is, of course, that the central stimulants, they have a high propensity to, uh, they can uh, cause uh, drug abuse, of course, if you take them like amphetamine or methylphenidate. And so that is one thing. The other thing is whether or not uh, methylphenidate or, or amphetamine treatment in ADHD increase the risk for abuse later on. And that data, as far as I know, are, are um, this, the conclusion is that it's not, sh you cannot say for sure that the risk of abuse is increasing if you treat children with ADHD with central stimulants. S some studies also show that you decrease the risk of, of future drug abuse. But that's a biological research, not a cultural research. Well, that's research on the diagnosis and uh, the risk of person with that diagnosis uh, being treated for drug abuse later on. So it's in the culture context, but it's, uh, there are biological based diagnoses, both drug abuse and ADHD, of course. 
and science is expanding very quick. I know uh, I can give another example. Some years ago, everyone should take probiotics or give probiotics to the newborn children and follow up because that was a way to establish a, a well-functioning intestinal flora. Today we see that many of these children get uh, asthma when they are older. That is totally unexpected. So all these different things coming up much later, it's difficult to see it now. There are a couple of schools in the US um, who have um, investigated uh, better foods, better lunches. And I have also had a project with um, former criminals with better lunches. And one of them actually found that after three months on a good diet, he had no addiction to drugs any longer. And this was very good. Uh, but the thing is that 38% in most of those um, uh, investigations in the prisons and in schools, uh, they, they um, decrease the aggressions with uh, about 38%. Um, just to make another diet, a better diet. So it's a very good, great impact on diet. Mm. And it's Shu and Thaler who have done a lot of this, and Gesh in, uh, and in, uh, in Holland, in the Netherlands. They, use, uh, they have decided to give um, vitamin pills to the, the prisoners just to to, to make them feel better. And it's many of them, 40% in prison has ADHD, so it's very important. What are some of the, um, the physical effects that we know of, of the ADHD drugs? I, I mean, I, I have done some research around um, loss of appetite, and also um, there's, the, the children lose weight, that it affects their growth. It's, there's a lot of other effects. What can, we, what can we bring into this conversation about those? Do you, do you know? You can read about it and <laughs> everyone can. But um, there's also yeah, effects on the circulation that's well known with the risk of raised blood pressure and pulse. And also very rare cases, but reported cases of really cardiac disease uh, a young person, I know it was written in the uh, doctor's uh, uh, magazine in Sweden, like a Tiningen, um, who, who was close to heart transplant um, because of cardiac disease and he had been taking stimulants for many years and it went back when he stopped the medication. And that's, of course, um, anecdotes, it's very seldom, but anyway, uh, this, there are also really serious physical effects that could appear. And it's d important to have that in mind, I think. But I also think that the, there are uh, psychological uh, side effects that we uh, must be very aware of and that we could easily miss. Um, like uh, the kids often, they don't get, get as happy. They are like, they are calmer, but they are also a, a bit, um, there's a risk of uh, even depression. And sometimes you only see it after maybe years. Oh, he's never happy. And when they stop the medication, now he's, <laughs> and, and maybe it's not so severe as depression, but more like a, a dysphoria. They are not really, and I think it's uh, uh, a question that if we should um, um, use it for so many kids, I think we should really try to restrict it to those who have the biggest problems. And, and we, need, we need really research on non-pharmacological treatments. Uh, that's, uh, and we need to have that supported from the government because the pharma pharmaceutical industry will not pay for that. So we need uh, of official financed research on non-pharmacological treat treatments. And how do you generate that in Sweden? <laughs> I mean, I think this gets back to Johan, your point about, you know, how are we seeing this? Is it, if we're calling it a disease, 
then the way that it gets treated is very different. Yeah. <coughs> I would like to, in that question, uh, to pick up the preschoolers comment. Uh, she talked about, or you talked about, um, uh, you talked about uh, when you meet the kid and when you talk to the kid you get the answers. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I think that is one thing that we are missing also up till now in this, this in, under this day, the risk of uh, objectivization of the, of the kid when we talk about ADHD and uh, how to treat ADHD and how to relate to that uh, in general, that, that comes with the risk of uh, being uh, seeing the kid as an object that we should treat in a sense. And I would like to just uh, make a remark uh, on, on the idea about the special unique kid in a very special unique ecology uh, and if we don't have that focus, uh, uh, individual focus, when we relate to each and every kid with problem that we call ADHD and make an analysis, a systemic analysis of that special kid in that special relations with the, those special parents, that special school and so on, we will not reach uh, the, the point of helping in a very good sense. So I would like to just uh, uh, to say uh, and to make a point about uh, uh, that the kid, what is most important when we uh, approach a kid with problems is that we try to understand that kid's uh, I, uh, inner world and that kid's idea about the outer world. And if we don't understand that and try to relate to how this kid with, with its immature problems uh, uh, try to cope with the world that it meets, we don't get anywhere. So we need to start there to see the kid as a subject. This intellectual dictatorship in Sweden is very peculiar to this country. So I, I've given talks that must be at least 25 or 30 countries. And I know the situation in America. And there are very few people now on the planet who would say that ADHD is a simple brain disease, a simple neuropsychiatric condition. That um, H.L. Mencken, an American skeptic, said that for every complex problem, there's a simple answer, and it's always wrong. So this goes to your <laughs> complexity. The idea that the simple answer to ADHD is that this is a brain disease caused by genetics and treated by a pill is ludicrous. And usually I've said, talking about where's the best treatment anywhere, I talk about Italy and I talk about the Nordic countries and Sweden. But I didn't know about this. <laughs> this <laughs> you is have a, to refresh. I have to, this is a pocket of absolute ridiculous um, belief. It has nothing to do with the science. It's just ridiculous. And it's an emperor new clothes kind of situation, that your emperor has no clothes. <laughs> and you have to begin making the press aware of that, making parents aware of that. And that's why I said that this man is the most important man in the conference, because the guidelines are one way of influencing how people behave, what they believe. They're the kind of accumulated community standard. And it's very important that those guidelines not be overly influenced by a biologically reductionistic point of view that's completely idiosyncratic, totally outdated, has nothing to do with what anyone else thinks anywhere else. I think that th this view can be very um, appealing in some ways, and particularly appealing to parents. That if you've had a kid you can't control, who's driving you crazy, or a teacher, we have a classroom you can't control because of one kid or two kids who are driving everyone else crazy and preventing you from doing your job with the, the rest of the children. It's comforting to think that the problem is easily specifiable, understood biologically, and the result of chemical imbalance, and easily treated with a pill, even if that's not the case. 
it becomes doubly appealing when you give the pill and for the first three or four weeks or months or maybe even years, the kid's quieter and it feels like the problem solved. That approach makes very much sense for the 2%, or you might say even fewer than 2%. It doesn't make sense in the United States when we have 15% being diagnosed. You could say that a more biological point of view, makes, th that that point of view makes more sense the fewer the number of people who are being classified. So if you take a half of 1%, you say, our population is going to have half of 1% ADHD. The idea that it's more biological makes a lot more sense because it will be a very highly selected population of, of kids who develop the problem very early in life and have very severe symptoms regardless of the situation that are pervasive and persistent and they have something that clearly they're, they're more born with. But when you extend the diagnosis, and in the US to 15%, and you're starting to move in that direction, at least in some of the provinces, then it becomes ridiculous to think that all of a sudden, all these people have a brain disease. And how come there's more brain disease in one province than another province? I heard that one theory was that all the dumb people, all the people who had troubles, all the people with ADHD moved to one area. <laughs> no, it's gonna be one practitioner in that area is prescribing ADHD medicine for lots of people. The common sense approach is not to think that there's a great variety in brain disease, to think that there's a great variety in practice habit. So for parents, I think that it's important to give a sense that there isn't a simple solution, that for the kids who have very mild spectrum problems, medicine may be something they need to protect the kid from. Um, you wouldn't have a parent telling a kid to take steroids so he would be a better football player. That would be absurd. You similarly should have the idea, if you're a parent, that my kid shouldn't be on stimulants unless there's a real reason, because we don't know what will happen with them. And there has to be demonstrated real reason where other things have been tried first, including acceptance of difference, where the environmental manipulations have been made, where little hints about different types of parenting or uh, given in a collegial fashion, sometimes psychotherapy, where all of these things are tried first before the simple answer of the pill. Parents have to be re-educated. The press used to be a great forum for trumpeting the latest medical discovery or the latest medical theory. And fortunately, recently, the press has become very skeptical because there's been so much hype and so many disappointing results from overselling treatments. And I think the media are crucial. I, I would say the second most important group after the guideline maker, the second most important group in the room would be reporters. Because you have the power to, if the professionals don't talk to each other, that's terrible. If they do talk to each other, that's better. But if they talk to each other and don't talk to the public and don't talk to the politicians, that's really deadly. And if there's an atmosphere here in the press that if you're willing to say that the emperor has no clothes and they say you're crazy and you can't speak up, that's a distortion. That's like when Donald Trump becomes president of America. Uh, that's a distortion of, of the truth that can't really be tolerated. And I think that if you only have a couple of people speaking up, they're easy targets. If lots of people speak up, then it becomes clear that the emperor has no clothes. So the press is very important. Cultivating the press is very important. Never refusing an interview is very important. Even if you're afraid that when you say something, someone else is gonna say you're crazy, the more interviews you do expressing something that everyone else in the rest of the world knows, this is a little folia Sweden, that <laughs> once, once it's expressed, the cat will be out of the bag and it won't, no, there will no longer be this tyranny of ideas, which is absolutely absurd and, and, and surprising that you all have accepted it for so long. Um, one last thing. Uh, on the issue of substance abuse, one that you, you're very interested in and that you commented on, it's a very puzzling literature because some studies have found actually reduced rates and other studies have found increased rates in some studies. I think it's very much the population. So I, I think that to the degree that the diagnosis is used carefully, 
for people who really have ADHD, I don't think that population is too much at risk. But when you start expanding the numbers from the 2 to 3 percent or 1 percent to 10 or 15 percent, you're going to start getting lots of people who may be in the ADHD treatment seeking partly because they want the pills. You get a completely different sample. The less they need the pills, the more likely they'll be using them for abuse. So I think that, that that's a question, again, another reason why the medicines are very useful. Anyone who says that all of this is crazy is also wrong. Anyone who's reductionistic in the other direction, no one has ADHD, no one should be on medicine. This is just a myth. That's also wrong. But I think that taking a, a middle view that commonsensically looks at the individual kid and the situation that kid is in, has he come from uh, Afghanistan for three months and been beaten up. Those symptoms mean something different in that kid, different in a kid who has domestic abuse, different as you start raising your class sizes. If you start making the classes bigger, you'll suddenly see more ADHD. Looking at this, and birthday, looking at all the factors and then saying, with this particular person, the risk-benefit analysis tilts in the direction of making the diagnosis or not making it. And for me, the earlier the onset, the more persistent the symptoms, the more they occur all over the place, not just in reaction to one stressor, the uh, less they're related to outside stress, and the more years the kid has and nothing else has worked, the, the, those would tell me, yes, let's, let's intervene. And then I'd be looking at population rates in different parts of the country and different parts of the country over time. One of the things that you notice consistently is a few practitioners can dramatically change the rates. In Western Australia, they did a study and they found it was four guys. Western Australia had twice the rate of ADHD of any other part of Australia equal to the American rate. Turned out to be four guys. What they did was establish a quality assurance and they kept pointing out their overuse. They were shamed in the newspapers and within a very short period of time, Western Australia had the same rate as the rest of Australia. It's usually just a very few people who are very much influencing the differences. But one thing I think is uh, difficult is to how, how can we maintain the complex way of understanding problems? Because it's not only about ADHD, it's about a lot of problems, but one big issue is the reductionist way of understanding problems. Yeah, I, one of the things I love to, to say is that we should all um, embrace uncertainty. That when in doubt, go for I don't know rather than come up with a simple answer, it's this diagnosis or that diagnosis. And particularly with kids, you're often in doubt because it's very hard to predict how they will turn out developmentally and especially because kids use drugs a lot. If you take a teenager and he's distractible and um, hyperactive, that may very much, especially if it's late onset, that very much maybe he's on drugs. And then the genius thing to do is give him a diagnosis of ADHD and give him legal drugs. The, the, the less classic, the later the onset, this, again, the same things over and over again said, the more you're picking the small group, the less likely you are to make mistakes with the large. And when you're not sure, the simple answer is let's wait and see. Let's observe. I think the guidelines should work quickly for very classic presentations that are very disturbing and absolutely need an intervention. Otherwise, the kid will be suspended from school or something will ter terrible will happen. The, the guidelines should work to eliminate people who clearly don't have the diagnosis. There will be a middle group of people where you just don't know, and the recommendation is watchful waiting. One of the best treatments in medicine is watchful waiting, not jumping to conclusions. <laughs>